So it's a, a real pleasure for me to come here and talk before you. It's a different kind of experience, as you understand. We are all used to giving scientific seminars, but not to such broad audience. And uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity. So uh, I had a bigger challenge, actually. I didn't have my luggage. So I had to run back and do some shopping. And I also took this opportunity of going back early. I followed Berenice and Gitanjali's and Shangamitra's presentations as they had something else to talk apart from their science. And uh, I took the opportunity yesterday evening to make <laughs> some three, four slides, you know, to talk in that tune. Uh, so um, before I go to the science part, I hope this works. So uh, again, I made a line. Just as I said, I, I need to acknowledge these people because I took the idea from them. So, but uh, I wanted to share uh, this slide because it, it's different. My story was completely different. When I was hearing to all other women, uh, I had a I had a very very hard starting in my life. So it uh, when I this was my MSc in 1982. Uh, things moved a little, so it should, be, should have been a straight line. I hope it doesn't happen in other slides. Anyway, so this, this was a good time. I passed my MSc I, with flying colors. I was first. I married who stood second. And things were, uh, you know, in a good shape to start with. Then I uh, went and joined. Um, I, I know you get the best labs and everything, so I joined Director Bosch Institute. Uh, at the time, and these five years, 83 to 87, I think today I'm, what I am is because of those five years, but those were the rough, very, very rough time of my life. I mean, I, I knew that I was not practicing science, but considering the amount of power that comes from being a director in an institute, and I being a small woman coming in a lab, you might be understanding, even if I don't say anything, how much difficult it was for me to cross those five years and do my PhD. I resigned. In fact, I resigned. And I, I mean, it's a very, very tough story not to be shared in this life. So it was simply going back five years. It started like that, and I was in like zero minus state. So I knew that I, but I did not lose any hope of doing good science. I used to study a lot. I knew what was going on around in the world. I used to keep up with all seminars, everything. So I knew I will fight back. So then I went to do my postdoc. And how God blessed me with having such an opposite experience with another person is remarkable. So this person taught me how to do science, what is the difference between a scientific worker and being a scientist. And uh, very first day, um, he opened instruments, you know, the oligonucleotide synthesizer, peptide synthesizer, the valves, the pumps, everything. He would disassemble and tell me, you disassemble. This was my starting. Hmm. So he said, watch me, I disassemble, and you reassemble. So it was a fantastic training that I have at a person. He took me to the library and he said, see, some people are lying down in the sofa and studying, and see other people who are making notes. Be like the person who is lying down in the sofa. If you can enjoy science like that, then you are doing science. If you are writing notes, you are a practicing scientist. Both are important, but be, try to be like that. When you will smile and read nature, you will enjoy science. So this is the kind of training that I got at this period. And all I owe everything to him. I, I, was a, I learned structure, function, of protein kinases very early. Yes, and he is a student of Edwin Krebs. You understand, Nobel laureate for protein kinase. Just after postdoc, he got the job. So uh, amino acid by amino acid. I mean, this is all I learned. I mean, anything and everything about protein kinases. Okay. Then I came back. My son was born. And these are the two men who actually nurture me, have always been beside me, and I with them. And um, 1991, like people are saying that uh, they had problem taking off. I never even worried about a minute for taking off because that was the training that 
Dr. Blumenthal gave me. You have to practice the art of slowing down. When you rush, not necessarily all rushing people are rushing at the right direction. He told me that you have to slow down, look at life from a very big distance, and understand what you are actually up to. So <clears throat> when I took off, I was not even a little, I mean, didn't even worry at all that I'm losing something. I used to study a lot at that time. And then I joined uh, Delhi University as a fast track scientist. And uh, at the time, I communicated a single author paper to plant physiology. You understand, plant in publishing in plant physiology was a big deal, right? But it didn't, didn't take. I won't say I did, crossed a challenge. People were admiring me, but I knew that I, you know, I understood protein kinase. It was just taking a protein kinase from a tissue and do all the exercises that I knew how to do, and I did it. So I understood, okay, that's not difficult. I mean, you can do things in India with small laboratories and everything. And then I joined as a faculty in Calcutta University. This is where I'm working since then. So this is the small history. And then what did I think when I was doing when I was taking off, right? So I was organizing my thoughts. I mean, I started organizing my thoughts when I was with Dr. Blumenthal, and last six months, I was sharing with this with someone else. I mean, I conceived when I was in USA, I delivered when I was in India, and I told him that if I conceive, I will not touch radioactivity. He permitted me. He, he, he was with me when I used to study and organize my thoughts. He used to study. He. Uh, uh, he taught me all those computational programs for you know, doing these charms, energy minimization, doing docking, and everything I learned at that time with him. So when I organized my thoughts, things that I uh, came in my mind, I'll work with plant, decision one, because I did not have any exposure on plant. And then I had a tremendous interest in, I mean, the godfather of all subjects is uh, photosynthesis. I will not say anything, but I tried for five years. It takes lot of biophysics, then biochemistry. By training, I was a chemist, and I was, I was, I understood that I'm not intellectually capable of handling a project on photosynthesis, which demands a lot of physics, you know. So I will not share that story, but uh, yeah, there was a lot of frustration there. Then there was totipotency, because plants do not have cancer. Whenever, the, whenever they have an unregulated cell division, they will just accommodate and turn on the differentiation program and make it bushy and make, just make accommodate it. They will not have cancer, mostly. Okay. So that was a very interesting developmental program that I wanted to handle. And finally, nitrogen fixation. These are the two things that is here in this planet for the last three billion years and have shaped up this planet. So I really wanted to work in all, any of these three, whichever comes, you know, this was my thought process. And the plant that I start wanted to work on is peanut. And the reasons will become clear at the end of the talk. Why did I think this? Now, from 1995 to 2005, was all those, I mean, I don't know why people, do, I had so much frustration at this time because whatever I was trying to do was either not working. It's not that I was not publishing. I was publishing good papers. I was being accepted as a good scientist. I was getting, you know, everything, I did not have any satisfaction because it was not oriented, it was just publishing papers, here and there, and these were not disconnected, you know, so I was not satisfied. But then, it is important that I acknowledge all the students who worked at the time and set the foundation of the lab. Not that I'll mention their names, but these are the people who worked very hard to get the lab glowing, going at the time. They are all faculty members, they're doing very well. Right? This is the girl who joined at the time. And you know, some students are game changers. Every, every one of us know. We have students, and some are game changers. Some are very good workers, right? So this is the one who is a game changer. This, together with all three of these students, Shejuti, Shundeep, Ayan, and Shudeep, were the critical mass. All four joined at the same time, brilliant scholars. This one, I mean, None of these could perform if she was not there. You know, it was like that. But this one was an excellent biochemist, could do protein kinase assays day and night, generate mutants and everything. This one, like a skilled engineer, tell him to make any construct to get it into plant, he will make it. And this one was a microscopic, micros under microscope. So whatever they used to go, ultimately it used to go to him, and he would do the microscopy. This team changed the game from 2006 
the game was set for symbiotic nitrogen fixation, which is what I'm going to tell. And now I will start exactly the way I made the platter to deliver. It will go right there. So that's it. The issue is nitrogen, right? And we all know that nitrogen, even if it is like 78% in the air, we cannot take it. It has to be cooked. And the cooked nitrogen is called reactive nitrogen. Either it is reduced in the form of ammonia or amines, or it is oxidized in the form of nitrate. This is what we can take. It is a cooked nitrogen that is important for us, right? And only the a specific, a very specific kind of microbes called diazotropes can cook nitrogen for us, right? And they do it with the help of an enzyme called nitrogenase. And there are two things that you need to remember. Nitrogenase is extremely sensitive to oxygen. So it only survives when there is an aerobic atmosphere and there's no oxygen. And since this enzyme could not evolve in last three billion years, what has evolved is the sophistication of measures by which you can avoid oxygen, either temporarily or spatially. Now, plants, obviously very intelligent, came a lot before us, have learned how to make good friendship with these bacteria to get, to reap the benefit of this fixation, right? And this is the smartest possible. There are a lot of kind, lot different kinds of uh, interactions that they developed, but this is the smartest. Here what happens, you have a organelle developed here, and in the cells, the bacteria, these round spherical ones of the bacteria, these are housed. So it's a very intimate relationship. And if you have followed the number, it came from one to 200 by having this good association. It's a win-win situation actually for both the microbe and the plant. The plant supplies the redu uh, reduced carbon in the form of carbon dioxide, I mean to, uh, dicarboxylic acids to the bacteria and the bacteria supplies the fixed nitrogen to the plant. So it's a win-win situation, right? Now, the pity is not all plant does it. Only selected hosts can do it. There are plants, many plants, which can house the bacteria not so intimately, but just outside the cell. The efficiency goes down. There are plants which are even more distant relationships. Like, you know, you have a mucilage secreted and the bacteria, the nitrogen fixing bacteria are here. They have a microaerophilic atmosphere right here and the fixed nitrogen goes out and the fixed carbon comes in. So that kind of not intimate, I mean, external relationships are also there. So why did I say all this? To take you to a number. Together, all these processes fix this amount of nitrogen right now in this planet. As opposed to, this is the amount that is being fixed synthetically by Haber-Bosch. So we see that the number we have already crossed in this planet, right? This is happening since 1909, since Haber-Bosch was discovered. Hmm. Now, let's take more numbers. This discovery and instrumental application of synthetic ammonia in the field started in 60s and see how it is going up. vis a -vis see how the population of this planet has gone up. In fact, this is called the detonator of human population explosion. Now, together with this, what has happened? This is a slide that I've been using for last 10 years. I didn't find a better one, so I still continue using this slide. This shows you clearly how much nitrogen in red is being pumped by humans, this as opposed to the one in blue, which is fixed naturally. The case, I mean, right now, any one of us sitting, I mean, half of us wouldn't have been alive anyway if this was not fixed. And those who are alive, we have 50% nitrogen fixed by Haber-Bosch, not by natural fixation. And if you are all aware that biological system discriminate against certain isotopes, always, they prefer the lower mass, then you understand what has happened to the isotopic balance of nature. So, and I mean, I mean, to make st hard statements, the pollution of uh, air, water, eutrophication of coastal ocean, everything has gone bad. So unless there is a political will, nothing will happen, right? Because synthetic nitrogen fixation involves a lot of money. So it is here to stay. But with all this um, 
happening, the awareness has reached an optimum in last two, three years. The awareness has really reached high and we have this. So by 2014 and 15, we have made an uh, international nitrogen management system. And now they acknowledge that nitrogen is the godfather of pollution. And they understood that because uh, there is no industrial uh, gain in uh, promoting natural fixation as opposed to synthetic fixation, it has to be publicly funded. And so we have these programs. These are only the programs which help the plant biologists to take up the issue. There are more programs which helps the environmental, the soil biologists to take up the issue. And I am personally involved with this program. Hmm? And um, so what do these programs aim at? Number one, obviously take the time-tested, time-honored aspects. Do the, do the, 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 the exercise prudence in agriculture like bring the nitrogen fixing crops along with the non-nitrogen fixing crops together by intercropping and rotational cropping and everything, right? And that is yielding. Even the advanced economies like uh, the European and the American economies, it is yielding, it is working. And I personally think this should be done first because that will save a lot of uh, pollution. The second is, uh, you know, this, the earlier one was without disturbing what is happening. This one was like bringing in more different crops which uh, have a novel way of interacting with nitrogen fixing bacteria and bring them into cultivation. The other one is the base of all the industry, the center of biofertilizers, all those who are, you know, sit in uh, advisory committees, we know thousands of projects will come for biofertilizer. 10,000 of papers are getting published, but you know, nothing is happening because the amount of nitrogen fixed by such, you know, not intimate relationships is very low. Hmm. So what happened is, this is what is happening. This company, Ginkgo Bioworks, has joined hands with Bayer this March 2018 to launch this company, which are now going to design bacteria which will go and colonize in other plant, any plant that they, that they want to. And then there is another extreme engineering where people are trying to put the enzyme straight in the plant, in the mitochondria or in the chloroplast. Obviously, this is still limited to papers. This has is, this is not seen the light as yet. And this brings me to the subject that I practice. So this is like taking, yeah, it won't take much time because I didn't mean to bring a lot of science here. Yeah. So uh, what happened is, uh, so this was, uh, this was the, um, oh, sorry, where were I? Huh. So, so then the question is, who are the ones which, which can do it and who are the ones which cannot do it? So this is a, a phylogenetic tree of all land plants where the red ones can fix. So these have the tools and these don't, right? But then people have understood that, you know, these, all these plants can do a beneficial relationship with fungus. So they understood, okay, that means the symbiosis genes are everywhere and the bacterial association is actually piggybacking on existing mycorrhizal genes, right? So it won't be that difficult. So then they found that the rice genes can function in legumes. That made, you know, these many papers, these ideas, and people are just jumping in into doing exercises that will show that we can do this, uh, get it from the fiction to the reality. So these are the modules that we do. And now I come to the CEFIPRA program. What I do is that why, why did I start working on Arachis? So what happened is when you take the bacteria in, they make a tunnel-like structure, these plants. And then they take it to the nodule proper where the cell is dividing. And there are some plants which do not make this structure, just take it to natural cracks and make the structure. One plant is Arachis, which I practice. This is, this is peanut. And this is the plant that the French group practices. So we, we started doing this like decades back, like me, 2005, and they were also doing it even more earlier, like 90s. 
So together, we were practicing the same thing, I mean, with the same ambition that we are going to discover a pathway that is much smaller, minimal, than the one which is being practiced by others. So uh, this minimal pathway is also being used by other, other plants which, uh, where you know, the nodulation does not happen. So this is my French collaborators with Cephipra, and uh, we all, we together, we try to understand the symbiosis of the kraken tree symbiosis. And this is, uh, this is something that we came up with. It's very complex, but I can only focus on this and tell you what we did. I mean, do you see the recognition happens in the surface with the receptors, and the receptors like difference, different, I mean, distinguish between the friend and the foe. And here, I wanted to compare this with a airport entry and thinking that there are, you know, this many gates and which are barcode controlled. And the, the question is, who are the barcodes that the bacteria have? So these are the kind of barcodes that the bacteria has had. When I say that they have barcodes, I mean they have the chemoattractants as well as the receptors together. And so then I put the marks on the barcodes, I mean the scanners. So it will look like this, gate one, gate two, gate three, and an uh, ununderstood gate, right? Then with all our analysis, we could say that in the infection thread model, in the complex model, this gate is functioning, this gate is functioning, this is functioning, this is absent. And for ours, this is present, very much present. This is, it may be absent depending on the cultivar. It may be absent or present. This may be absent or present. And this is absent and divergent. So a clear picture has come out that the epidermal processes, which is so important here because you need to make a tunnel-like structure to get in, depends on these structure, depends on these gates. But this entry, which is so minimal, do not care to have these gates. So this, and so this is the, I mean, easiest way I could explain this. So what we do is we, gate by gate, we try to understand the mechanism. And um, so I collaborate with an Argentinian group where I understand, try to understand only the LCO gate. And we make colored bacteria who are defective in barcode. And we make them cooperate, compete, or whatever with the gates on, open, or gate closed. That's the kind of experiments we do. Then we have, I have a collaboration with Innovative Oxford, where we have bacteria uh, which can make nodules in the legume. And in other plants, our target plants, it can colonize like this. So these are the professional figures. So the idea is we have made comparative genome of genomics and trying to understand what prevents them, even if they have the barcodes, what are the scanners that are absent here, which is preventing them to get inside the cell. So that's another exercise that we do. This I can handle myself. So we were talking about this. This I can handle myself. So here what I do is, so why do we need to make artificial nodulation? So here is, a, so how does this happen? So when a bacteria comes, it is in blue, there is a stem cell forming formation here. These stem cells immediately cooperate with these bacteria, and there is a connection, which I show like this. So there is a handshake happening here. And that is why the bacteria, um, I mean, reaches the subtending primordia. Here, what happens is, yes. Here, what happens is, we, 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 if we make artificial nodulation, then we put a hand out. That means we can wait for a bacteria to come in. So that's the whole purpose of making artificial nodulation. So we have developed a method where we could, without a bacteria, we could develop nodules. And if you compare this method with uh, the existing methods that were there, which are all patented, and the one that we published, which is so high, so effective, it's not patented. You don't have time to, we just publish. I mean, there's no time to do all those practices there. So um, I mean, then I get tempted to tell you, what did I do? This is the receptor kinase that I, that I actually practice in my lab. And uh, we know. I mean, we know that the, these are the phosphorylations. The blue are phosphorylations, red are phosphorylations. We know the exact uh, phosphoproteome map of this uh, receptor kinase when it prepares the aircraft, makes the housekeeping, reservates the ones which are actually allowing the bacteria in. So we can differentiate these two. So what we did is when we made an artificial nodulation, we took out these 
phosphorylations and we could make a construct. We could straight go and make the make ready the aircraft or make the modules so the bacteria can walk in it. So that's that. These are my collaborators and my funding. And uh, I think I need to acknowledge this farmer couple because this girl was brought up by my mother. She was abandoned by her family, left before the school. And she was brought up in our, with my, I mean, in our place. And she did all the experiments in the field for me. And this is the battery of students that are presently working. And thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mekhaï, for this uh, fascinating talk. Maybe you can take one question before uh, moving to the next. OK, thank you. You keep, you keep this a question. OK. <laughs> uh, um, just because I was so happy to see some sugar, because I'm working in data <laughs> science. <laughs> so the uh, receptor, the kinase you are talking about, is, is other the one who have a uh, um, lectin binding domain, and they can recognize the sugar? Those are the scanners, the ones which receive and recognize the barcodes. The barcodes are the sugars, and they are the ones which are actually in the gate. But the one that I work on is a central surveillance. So for crossing the gate, you have to take permission from the. So for each gate crossing, that surveillance officer has a role to see whether the scanner is working properly and whether it's not making any mistake in making. So for each break, you have the permi you have to take the permission, and for that. The ligand is unknown. In all respect, we are thinking that it is uh, exocytosed peptide and all. I mean, so those are big stories. Yeah. So, but it's not the uh, sugar. It's not in the entry gate. No. Thank you. So we have uh, some other discussion. Uh, especially knowing that the inverse of leguminosity are always, uh, you know, known for nitrogen fixation through nodules, right? Yeah. 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 And you also were showing somewhere that, that the pteridophytes like fern and gymnosperm and lycopores, they also uh, fix through mycorrhiza? Yes, not in my case. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. okay. If we build up on those common genes, which are commonly being used by the bacteria and the fungus, then we can build up the symbiosis. So that's the dream. Okay. Okay. Usha, last question. The mycorrhiza, which is a very ancient yes. symbiont in all mm -hmm. fungus, that is that structure in any way similar to the nodule made by bacteria? Because uh, when you talk about VAM interaction, that structure is very different, isn't it? Uh, the cell division is not involved. That is the biggest difference. In nodulation, we have a stem cell formation. Yeah, and there is a divided cell. The divided cell only attracts the bacteria. That's the model. In mycorrhiza, no cell division is involved. That's the biggest difference. One, organogenesis involved. The other, no. Absolutely, absolutely. To division to take the, uh, absolutely. That's the difference. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.